welcome to everybody waiting for European election. This is the title of our conferences series. But we are not only waiting or even fearing as many do in a passive way. Sciences Po wanted to be more active and to prepare these elections. Because we know that it is likely that they will deeply challenge our understanding of what Europe integration is becoming. That's why we have decided to organize four conferences dealing with major European challenges. When I say we, I mean the Paris School of International Affairs, thanks to its dean, Andre Coletta, the School of Public Affairs, thanks to its dean, Yann Algan, OFCE and its president, Xavier Rago, and myself, I'm, I am not Xavier Rago, I'm Florence Egel, <laughs> on behalf of the Center of European Studies and Comparative Politics. What are the main challenges Europe is facing now? Dismemberment and all its risks with Brexit. Democratic distrust with the need of institutional reforms and the rise of populism all over Europe. And of course, mobility and migration. We will dedicate our conferences to these four topics, Brexit, institutional reforms, migration, and populism. Today's topic is Brexistential dilemmas. This is unpronounceable for me and unsolvable for many others, and that's worse for them. This is also a stylish and sophisticated, sophisticated manner. I suspect that the Cambridge Stout, is, isn't it Colin, is, is responsible for, for, for this title? Sorry. <laughs> well, it's a very stylish manner to say that it is a mess. That's why we need to clarify was what is at stake. Don't worry, talking about existential dilemmas will not lead us to metaph metaphysical issues. But we will raise major questions such as bright British identity and borders, how Brexit has put Westminster model and British leadership and party system under pressure? What do we learn about EU membership through the lens of dismemberment? But to be very short and to, to conclude this, uh, this word of welcome, I would like to come back to the title of this conference series, Waiting for European Election. It reminds to all of us the well-known Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot. I think that this reference is meaningful. First, of course, because you know Samuel Beckett was Irish, and Ireland and its borders are at the core of Brexit dilemma. But also because the play is about a word of existential uncertainty, and that is also what is Brexit. As you know, Waiting for Godot gave place to a lot of interpretations. Beckett himself was wondering about this. Why people have to complicate a thing so simple I can't make out, was one of his statements in 1955. By the way, 1955 is the birth year of the European flag. Another, another time, as he was asked what the play was really about, his answer was, it's all about symbiosis. Symbiosis. The dictionary tells us that symbiosis is a relationship between two different organisms that live close together and depend on each other in particular ways each getting particular benefit from the other. As you see, we are getting back to our point, Brexit, which is a question of uh, the break of symbiosis also. 
And uh, I let the floor, uh, and thank you very much, and I let the floor to Xavier Rago, who, who will chair this uh, debate, debate and this discussion. And uh, I hope you will have a, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, new understanding of what happened in this Brexit dilemma. Thank you, Florence, for this introduction. Uh, and thanks uh, all of you to be here today for this uh, fantastic panel. Uh, my role will be a kind of a European institution type of uh, role, implementing the rule to have a decent debate among four excellent panelists on the subject of the Brexit. So this panel is very nice because we have two main policy uh, leaders from the UK, I will introduce them in a couple of words, and two academics at the same time, knowing a, a lot about what's going on in the UK and in Europe as well. So let me introduce rapidly uh, the four panelists. The rule will be the following. Each of them will have 10 minutes to make a point about what's going on in the UK, what will happen at the end of March, and maybe what will be the consequences for other countries uh, for the European election. So 10 minutes each. After, they will maybe a couple of minutes to answer each other to see on what they agree and disagree, things like that. And we'll try to keep one hour discussion from the floor to answer your questions, your, to, to hear your remark. Uh, I will ask you to introduce yourself rapidly, who, who you are, where you come from, just to, to have an idea of where from what perspective you see the problem. And at the end of the day, uh, if we need some clarity, uh, be sure that we will have some clarity because Enrico Letta will conclude. So if it's necessary, we will have uh, solved the, uh, the remaining issue of the Brexit uh, tonight. So I'm very happy to introduce uh, the four panelists. So let me do that very rapidly. Uh, the first panelist will be uh, Fiona uh, Islop. Uh, who was appointed the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs uh, in Scotland. She's a member of uh, the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and uh, so she's a main policy leader. She will speak about uh, Brexit from this view. I think it will be very interesting. After, uh, we will hear John Breton, which is a former Irish uh, Prime Minister. So uh, once again, a view of the Brexit which will be very interested. I read that you were appointed uh, uh, actually elected in the Irish Parliament at the age of 22. So you have a deep view of uh, UK one politics month. and one month. So uh, uh, we'll uh, see uh, your deep understanding of what's going on today. Uh, then um, Calypso Nicolaidis will uh, speak for 10 minutes. She is a professor of international, international uh, relations at uh, the University of Oxford. So thank you for being here. And uh, finally, uh, Colin A, uh, which is a professor of uh, political sciences uh, here at uh, Centre d'études européennes and uh, affiliate professor at uh, the University of Sheffield as well. So. Uh, that's all, so let me give the floor to uh, Fiona. Thank you for being here, and what is your view on the Brexit? Okay. What will happen? Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, first of all, can I say I represent the Scottish Government, not the United Kingdom Government. <laughs> Scotland is an ancient European nation, uh, which is part of the British state, which is dragging the people of Scotland out of the European Union against our will. And of course, uh, Scotland voted 62% to remain. So uh, using the Godot analysis, we're not in symbiosis with the UK. Um, our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, was in Paris on Monday. Uh, she opened our first ever government hub here in Paris. And of course, on Saturday, we'll be sending our Scottish rugby team here to France. The title of this session is Brexistentialism. So is Brexit an existential crisis? Uh, yes, it is for the UK, uh, but not, I think, for the rest of the EU, who seem to have been able to galvanise to act collectively for a common purpose as the EU27, standing firm in protection of one of their number, Ireland, and just maybe seeing off populism in the European elections. 
by pointing out the damage the Brexiteer populists are causing in the UK. In the UK, Brexit is an existential crisis for the established political parties in particular, not uh, just the Conservatives, but it also has a historic perspective. As a teenager in school, I discovered Jean-Paul Sartre, a father of existentialism, and read The Age of Reason. Brexit is not being played out in any shape with reason. If you try to understand what is happening in the Westminster Parliament and government just now by logic or rationality, you will fail. There is a far more existential underpinning, however. There is a war for the soul of the Conservative Party, which underlines much of this for the last few decades, not just the last few years. The extreme Brexiteers whom Theresa May has hitched her wagon to are driving this, and they are far more interested in trying to rediscover a 1950s Britain that never was than forging a future for all. And these are the same people who have already moved their considerable wealth offshore for profit purposes. So there is a war within the British Conservative Party, um, and if there is such, then as Sartre said, when the rich wage war, it's the poor who die. And it's not just me that's saying that. Only today, the editorial of one of our biggest selling papers in Scotland, the Daily Record, said, and I quote directly, and this is from this morning, the tragic truth is that there is a school of pro-Brexit opinion that is entirely immune to facts, reason, or rational thinking. Hardline Brexiteers can only be described as an economic death cult. Now, that's their quote, not mine. Of course, the ex existential issue is one of historic proportions and needs historic analysis. We should be quite clear that what we're seeing now are the last death throes of the British Empire. And if you don't believe me, you should read the most colonial, almost colonial comments made by senior BBC interviewers and also politicians in the UK about Ireland, failing to grasp that it has long, long been an independent state. So don't underestimate that the fall of empire in affecting the psyche of a political class clinging to a sense that they are a world power, power at the centre of the universe. And former UK Prime Minister John Major, in a speech in Glasgow this week, warned that the UK, in its attempt to leave the union with Europe, risks Scotland leaving the political union with England and makes independence for Scotland and indeed a united Ireland more likely. That's what John Major said. Now, I happen to agree that the mess of Brexit strengthens the case for independence for Scotland, but it doesn't make it inevitable. And to quote Sartre again, freedom is what you do with what's been done to you. And our First Minister will set out the next steps for independence for Scotland in the next few weeks when Brexit becomes clearer, we hope. Of course, Brexit is and always uh, was shorthand for whatever anyone wanted it to mean. And with 37 days to go, the United Kingdom government is still trying to decide what it means and what it wants. And there is one lesson for this, perhaps for the European elections on the continent. Do not let the populace define your politics by meaningless slogans which don't mean anything. While the EU27 established a common negotiating mandate, the UK Prime Minister has controlled everything herself. She couldn't take her cabinet with her, didn't seek uh, any early Westminster Parliament consensus and mandate, and is repeatedly losing votes in the Westminster Parliament of historic proportions. And of course, the issue of the backstop, of course, arose because the Prime Minister didn't speak to the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland on, at that time, a low-key technical regulatory alignment position that had been agreed with the Irish government. So in existential terms, Brexit is about the decades, if not centuries, um, old battle within the uh, Conservative Party. And you could say the battle goes back to the Corn Laws about the relationship with Europe, compounded by the British state, which has struggled, really struggled, to define itself and its role in post-World post -World War II. From a Scottish perspective, and again in reference to Sartre, England exists but needs to find its essence for the present in the future in a different world. So now we have a Brexit careering to a no deal crash in 37 days or a negotiated withdrawal deal trapped within the very narrow red lines of negotiation of Theresa May. 
I, I have long argued that to break out of this would take a domestic political crisis in the UK rather than negotiation with the EU. Now, the Labour Party in the UK has broken first, with now eight MPs leaving the party in the last few days. It was seven yesterday. I had to update it this morning. Um, and they've formed an independent group in Westminster. And today, three Conservative MPs have joined that group. So overnight, opinion polls in the UK have put this new independent group at 10%, head of the Liberal Democrats, the current fourth party. So if they align with them and they start to threaten the traditional two-party system in the UK, you could see a political crisis uh, developing. But we still have only 37 days to go. Now, the Scottish Government now has no deal as our central planning assumption. Our Emergency Resilience and Response Planning Group, uh, led with Cabinet Ministers, is meeting weekly and preparing for the worst. That could mean a doubling um, of uh, unemployment to 100,000. This is grim indeed. It would be a catastrophe. It need not have been so. Um, the Scottish Government have uh, offered a compromise of single market membership and customs union membership for over two years as an option, but I fear that ship has sailed. The Scottish Government believes in freedom of movement, absolutely essential in terms of our country. EU nationals are part of our society and we want them to stay. The best option now is for extension of Article 50 and a second referendum, but a majority for that would need the Labour Party to shift. The cross-party agreement that Mr Barney has referred to in recent days is unlikely if the Prime Minister continues to reject the customs union membership the Labour Party wants, and that rejection may still push Labour towards a second referendum. Now, we have learnt that speculation is dangerous, but what might be possible is an agreement of Theresa May's deal to avoid an ordeal, but that would uh, then have to be put to a referendum against Remain in the EU and a request for the EU to extend Article 50 to accommodate that. But who knows? Theresa May most certainly has iron in the soul, uh, but I'm not sure that that is a good thing for any of us. Um, I'm far from certain that we'll see uh, the reprieve, the other book in the trilogy, from exist exiting the EU. It's possible that the UK government and the EU could agree a change in the political declaration that could focus on review arrangements on the backstop to kick in if no broader trade agreement has been reached after a certain time. But if the withdrawal agreement is not to change, you could not have a unilateral um, position on that. There could be a description of what um, any alternative agreements would need to achieve in order to replace the backstop with a legal, legally binding commitment on the EU side that if these conditions were met, the backstop would not need to be triggered or could be abandoned. Now, the beauty of this option is that from an EU perspective, they are merely setting out a theoretical possibility that they do not expect to use um, or to, to arise, while for the UK Brexit supporters um, of the so-called alternative arrangement to the backstop, this seems uh, to provide a genuine way of avoiding the backstop. So the, the national animal um, of Scotland uh, since ancient times is a unicorn. So for those of you who still believe in unicorns, um, uh, an option allowing an automatic escape from the backstop if a unicorn appears might be an acceptable compromise which would get a deal over the line. This is how ridiculous we've got to in some of these negotiations. So as you can imagine, uh, meanwhile, the rest of us live in angu uh, anguish, or to quote Sartre for a final time, the existentialist says at once that man is anguish. I do not want anguish for our neighbours in England or indeed in continental Europe and certainly not for the people of Scotland. I want a positive future for Scotland as an internationalist, inclusive, tolerant, open-minded and progressive nation which shares its sovereignty willingly as an interdependent state in the community of independent states which is the European Union. A European Union which is the biggest single market in the world and never forget has brought peace to continental Europe. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <coughs> uh, John, if you want to intervene. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, why is the European Union popular in Ireland? Uh, what is the Good Friday Agreement? Um, 
what effect will Brexit have on Ireland? Why isn't Ireland coming forward with a compromise to solve the difficulty now? Uh, and um, is um, Brexit going to lead to a united Ireland? These are some of the questions that I'm going to try to answer uh, if I get sufficient time. But if I don't get to answering them, I have no doubt you'll ask them later. Um, the European Union is very popular in Ireland because the European Union is organised in such a fashion as to ensure that small countries get an opportunity to be heard, that small countries have their interests institutionally taken into account. A big constitutional decision like Brexit, if it were being taken by the European Union, would have to be taken by either unanimous agreement between all 27 states or by agreement by a supermajority of the 27 states. In contrast, in the United Kingdom, another union, uh, you have a situation where a decision by two of the nations of the United Kingdom, England and Wales, because of a bigger population, overrides the decision of the two other nations, Scotland and Northern Ireland. That would not happen in the European Union. And that's why we like the European Union. It's fair. It's fair to smaller nations. And it does place a restraint on big countries, of course, which can be difficult for them. And big countries have a predominant preponderant weight in the European Union, but they have learned it's that it's in their interests to take everybody's interests into account. What is the Good Friday Agreement? The Good Friday Agreement basically is designed to deal with a problem which many of you in this room will be familiar with, where you have an area, uh, in this case the northeast of Ireland, where you have two more or less equal populations, completely intermixed, living on the same, in the same villages, living in the same uh, suburbs of, of, of the big cities, who have completely different national allegiances. One section of that community in Northern Ireland feel they are British and they do not want to be governed from Dublin they want to be part of something connected to London and to England and to the Queen and then you have an almost similarly large number of people living in the same area who feel passionately Irish now they're not necessarily anti-British but they want to feel and be allowed to feel and to, allow to, ex to be to able to express their sense of Irishness. Now that's been the problem in that part of Ireland for the last three or four hundred years. Uh, and up to very recently, up until the Good Friday Agreement, the attempt to resolve that was based on one side winning and the other side losing. If one side had won the Battle of the Boyne, if the side of the Battle of Boyne uh, who lost had won, you would have had a different situation. And one group would have had to take second place because another group won the Battle of the Boyne, the boot was, boot was on the other shoe, the sh shoe was on the, other, on the other foot, rather, for two or three hundred years afterwards. It was a zero-sum game, winner-takes-all approach to how do you reconcile these two nationa nationalities living in the same space. The brilliant thing about the, U the Good Friday Agreement is that it created three stranded structures, the aim of which was to allow both nationalities to feel fully at home in Northern Ireland, or at least have the potential of so doing. There were to be no barriers between Northern Ireland and the Republic, uh, and there were to be cooperative structures between North and South, that was to make nationals feel comfortable. However, no matter what happened, there was not to be, without majority consent, any change in the constitutional status of Northern Ireland as part of the European, as a part of the United Kingdom, and to achieve that, there was to be freedom of movement of goods and services between Northern Ireland and the mainland of Britain, and that was facilitated, of course, immensely by the fact that Britain and Ireland were both members of the European Union. Now, the Good Friday Agreement is, is, is based on that fundamental, simple idea: making every both sides feel at home in the same place, even though they have different allegiances. And it could, if it had worked properly, have been a model to resolve lots of problems in other parts of the world. However, it hasn't worked perfectly. Uh, the institutions within Northern Ireland are not functioning since January 2017. As a result of that, the cooperative structures between North and South are not working because the, the government of the Republic has nobody to cooperate with. 
and unfortunately the structures between East and West, between Ireland and the United Kingdom, which are the third part of the agreement, they were allowed to fall into disuse, unfortunately. Uh, but now along comes Brexit, which creates an existential crisis for the whole thing, because it requires, if it goes ahead, particularly on a no-deal basis, but even on other bases, it would require the introduction of barriers and boundaries between North and South and between East and West. Uh, and that is very, very problematic. And that's why the Irish government and the European Union, and the European Union has contributed substantially to supporting the peace process in Ireland over the last many, many years, is so insistent that Britain face up to what they didn't face up to during the referendum campaign, the fact that their decision was going to have a radically damaging effect on their neighbouring island and on the peace process to which they had contributed. Now, of course, there are other effects for Ireland of Brexit, not least the fact that we will be physically isolated from the rest of the European Union. We will be like Greece was for many years, with a large amount of non-EU territory between us and the European Union. And that's because Britain, in other words, as a non-EU country. And that's going to have serious disruptive effects on our, 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 our um, commerce. Now, the, the, other, other, the next question I want to address um, is what are Ireland's ideas for resolving the dilemma? Well, I'm asking myself that question, but I'm having to say that's a very unfair question that I'm asking myself, because we didn't create the problem. The people who promoted Brexit are the people who have the first responsibility to come up with a solution to ensure that Brexit doesn't damage the internationally agreed treaty which underlies the Good Friday Agreement on the basis of which we in Ireland changed our constitution. We had a referendum to change our constitution and we have an international treaty with Britain guaranteeing the Good Friday Agreement. Britain comes along with a proposal that's going to radically upset that. Uh, it's their proposal, Brexit is their idea, and we feel, well, they're the ones that should be coming forward with the, with the proposals to resolve the difficulty. So while I have a number of ideas as to how you could finesse the uh, backstop to make it a bit more acceptable, I'm not so sure that I'm the one that should be putting, it for putting them forward. Because if we put them forward, the state of mind in Britain seems to be one that no matter what anybody else put forward, they will reject it. Uh, remember, David Davis was in favour, one, uh, one of the leading Brexiteers, he was in favour of Britain being in the Customs Union a few years ago. But as soon as that was on offer, he rejected it. Because it, to, want, to some extent, what Brexiteers are looking for is not compromise. They're looking for catharsis. They're looking for a sort of moment where suddenly they're free. Now, they wake up the following day and they realise that they're not free at all, but they want this sort of catharsis. And a no-deal Brexit is a sort of cathartic moment for them. And to some extent, if that's what people want, offering them compromises that denies them their catharsis and brings them back to a reasonable accommodation is basically not what they're interested in. And I'm afraid that's the case, not with the majority of people in Britain, but with the majority who have the power who are the research group, the European research group in the Conservative Party. They are not interested, I believe, in compromise. So I'm not going to mention the ideas that have been put forward by Professor Carl Whelan of UCD, or Andrew Duff, former MEP, or Professor Kenneth Armstrong of Cambridge. All of those are indeed the German EFO uh, economic uh, a, 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 a economic think tank. They've all put forward ideas that could be, if they were put forward by Britain, and we were sure that Britain would be able to deliver on them if they were agreed to by us, that we could look at and possibly consider. But we're not going to be the first out on the dance floor. I think they have to come out onto the dance floor and show that they're prepared to make a few moves. Um, so that's my non-answer to the question. Um, will no deal... Am I running out of time? Two minutes. Two minutes, OK. I'll, I'll unite Ireland in two minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I won't, actually. Um, 
Is this controversy going to make a united Ireland uh, more, more, more likely? At the moment, it's interesting. There was an opinion poll done in Northern Ireland in November, and it suggested that if the UK were to stay in the European Union, that 60% of the people of Northern Ireland would be happy for Northern Ireland to stay in the United Kingdom, and only 29% would be interested in the United Ireland. Overwhelming majority to stay in the UK. If things remain as they are, if Britain stays in the EU. Conversely, if Theresa May's deal goes through, uh, with all the difficulties that it contains, contains, but you know, that would move to 48, 48, 48 to stay in the UK, 48 to join the United Ireland. Conversely, and really surprisingly to me, if there's a no deal crash out, and of course nobody knows how it will work and what it will mean, at, in those circumstances, 55% of the people in Northern Ireland polled said they would opt for a united Ireland, uh, and 40, only 42% would opt to stay in the UK. Huge change. Are we ready for a united Ireland which would flow from a no deal? Are we ready for an opinion uh, for a, a border poll that would might result in that outcome? Absolutely not. The situation is that at the moment the economy of Northern Ireland is subsidised as to 25% of GDP by transfers from London. Britain is a big country with a big exchequer. They can possibly make those tra net transfers. Ireland is a small country. It may be a relatively prosperous country at the moment, but it is a small country. And there's no way that we could replace those subsidies. Also, you've got to take account of the fact that a change in constitutional status uh, achieved as a result of a referendum, let's say, to take a recent example, 52 to 48, uh, <laughs> would not be accepted by the 48. And if that was the... Uh, possible scenario in which a united Ireland came about and it could come about on that basis. How would the 48 be coped with? Would they remain peaceful? So the threats of violence are not just the threats that there might be to border posts which would have to be introduced if there's an old deal Brexit. There's also the threat of violence arising from what might flow, what might flow from the change in sentiment in Northern Ireland towards the united Ireland and the resistance to that, which could be violent. Now, I was in Dublin <coughs> in 1975, and I was within about uh, 200 metres of the loyalist bombs that went off and killed a large number of people in Dublin. I saw a portion of a car going up into the air, going up 100, uh, going up about 70 metres up into the air with the severity of the explosion. I know what loyalists can do. I know what the IRA can do. One of my parliamentary colleagues was murdered by the IRA. I don't want to go back to that. And I think people in Britain should also recognise that as a result of the troubles in Ireland, an attempt was made to murder their Prime Minister. <coughs> Mercifully, it failed. But a number of prominent uh, British politicians were murdered. Uh, we don't want to go back to that. And that seems not to have figured in people's calculations in regard to, in regard to, uh, to, 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 to Brexit at all in Britain. And that's why I would hope that Britain would uh, re reconsider um, this entire matter. Thank you. You just heard three cries, two cries from the from the heart, and I will give you another one because I I'm a Franco-Greek citizen, exiled in Brexit land, and I've spent a lot of time hearing the sighs of Brexiters, you know, saying, "Well, all European roads uh, go back to Rome," because that, they're obsessed with this notion that EU is really the reincarnation of imperial Rome. Well, you know, for me, all the roads come back to Sciences Po, because I was sitting in those very seats almost 40 years ago, believe it or not. I know, I know, you don't believe it. But, <laughs> um, 
And indeed, uh, I hear that uh, you are more than 100 nationalities, um, and that's what you're all about. What you're all about is my credo. And my credo is, well, it's inspired also by another bit of my identity, which is that I might be Greco-French, but I'm becoming British, 20 years in that country, two British kids, uh, chair of the Oxford University Brexit Group, working with the FCO. So I kind of feel for the Brits these days. You know, it's kind of a mess to be British, and I'll be part of this mess. So my schizophrenia in this story, and I think I share it with a lot of EU citizens in Britain, British citizens in this country, and all of us intellectual scholars, European citizens who think these things, is that we need to reinvent a different language for our democracies and really rediscover the beauty and the importance of mutual recognition between peoples, between traditions, between languages. And I think that this is what you're doing at Sciences Po, but this is what we need to do in European politics. And this is why I want to ask you three questions about this beautiful Brexistential dilemma title that we heard. Indeed, Brexistential dilemma of the past, of the present, and of the future. So, Brexistential dilemma of the past. Well, can you ask ourselves, can we ask ourselves, how should we think about the reason for Brexit? Does it prove that the UK was and is the exception or is it a shared problem? And you know, I was just recently invited by Her Majesty's government to speak about Brexit in Morocco in French, you know, talk about a postmodern world. And this wonderful student asked, you know, Madame, est-ce que la reine peut stopper Brexit? I'm like, well, I don't know her, I haven't met never her, but I don't think so. Um, but, you know, there was a sense in Morocco from these young students that there was a bit of an awe or, you know, a kind of reluctant admiration for this Britain, where the elites who believe in remain are capable of putting themselves at the service of the people who've told them what to do, uh, and where the whole body politics is tearing itself apart to do the deed. Wow. True, could any other European countries ha have dared this thing? You have to be a bit of an exceptional country, right, to do such a thing. You're out asterixing the French, really, uh, with your Dunkirk spirit. Yes, but can we ask ourselves, on the other hand, you know, if you're a good French, you know that the French don't like to hear that, oh, yes, Britain is an exceptional country, because we're exceptional too, the French, right? Um, and all of you, uh, from all the countries you come from, you, you know that there's nothing less exceptional than exceptionalism. Every country has their exceptional story. Um, so perhaps the real question for Europe is, has the EU been capable of accommodating difference, accommodating exceptionalism? Should it relearn how to do that? Is that one of the questions of Brexit? But perhaps we are saying, no, this is not about Brit Britain and Brexit being about exceptionalism, either they're different or you will remain the exception. These are different meanings of exceptionalism. No, no, no. Brexit is a shared reckoning. That's what Brexit is, and that's maybe where Fiona and I disagree. Brexit is the canary in the mind. Brexit is the moment when indeed the existential question for Europe is posed by the fact that, yes, for decades now, we've had us, cosmopolitan Europeans, promoting a project in alliance with minorities of all sorts, as a minority who believe in free movement. Let's not forget we're only 4% of Europeans. And where we face a Europe where the silent majority, or perhaps the perha almost majority, wakes up and says, mm, no, we're not sure about this agenda. What do we do? This is a crisis of liberal values. It's not just in Britain. And indeed, of course, the Gilets Jaunes, totally different, obviously, but, and much more romantic in France. We do this, the protesting, not in the ballot box, but with les pavés. But indeed, there's a lot in common between the Brexit or ballot box and the Gilets Jaunes. So it is the moment when we need to ask this question of exceptionalism. But then, if we look at the second this was the past, because this is a cause. How did we get here? Second, the present. Where are we? What's going on? And are we going to get a no deal? And Fiona and John were brilliant and, and, and vehement about this. Um, and uh, from their view, both viewpoint, basically telling you, guys, this is a mess. And this is a mess of the Brexiters making and let them solve it. But John, I want to 
ask you, isn't it the case that any parents knows that we spend our life solving problems created by other, you know, like our kids or, you know, whatever. You know, th that's life. It's kind of a mess. So I think we all need to help sol solve the problem of the backstop, le filet de sécurité. And I would say that, in fact, London wants that too. Maybe there I disagree with John. In fact, you know, the hardcore Brexiters, there are 15 or 20 of the ERG, really the real hardcore. Most of the others, Brexiter in the 60s, they, they're trying to climb down the, lay, the ladder. And the huge majority of the Tory party absolutely does not want no deal. So we are faced with the irony where Europeans need to help the Brits get to deal. Now, heed that irony. This is a moment where we are really contemplating, as continental Europeans, the risk of a no deal that would immediately, more or less, create a frontier, about a border between North and South Ireland in the name of a backstop, which is all about making sure that there is never that border. And by the way, I think that if Ireland doesn't create that border, and the Brits say we'll never create a border, um, the EU 26 might, might, and the ambassador might correct me, uh, say, well, Ireland, sorry, you're going to have to have an, uh, a border in the Irish Sea, of the South Irish Sea, the Channel. Um, so it is bizarre when you think about it. And you ask me, well, how can European politicians do such weird things and get into this no-deal situation in the name of what might happen several years from now. And yes, there are the, all the profound questions about the Good Friday Agreement, absolutely. But why we can't solve the problem now, I think, has a lot to do also with macho politics. And not just macho politics in Britain. Yes, there is a prime minister, which is a bit macho, or she has machos behind her. But in Brussels, too. I mean, we need to rethink the art and science of negotiation and compromise and move beyond the two dogmatism that are facing each other, where you have the Brexiter dogmatism. In the name of liberty, we, will, we can bear the cost. As John said, in the name of the sea, the sea will part. You know, this is a, a chosen people that is, you know, flew, moving away from the shackles of Brussels and all of that, let the people go, and we will, you know, have the EU bureaucrats drown in, in, in the Red Sea of red tape and all of that. Yes, that is a dogmatism. But I think that there is also, on the EU side, a risk of dogmatism. And I don't think the EU is there quite yet. That in the name of the integrity of the single market, rather than only in the name of Ireland, we might be facing a situation where the very, very big costs on all sides might be borne. And I am very happy to revisit with you what I mean by this. So you ask about unicorn. Uh, Fiona already raised the beautiful flag. Um, I think there are non-unicorns who solve the backstop problem that have to do with using, indeed really using, the wonderful institutions which John was talking about. You know, the Good Friday Agreement, they created this great assembly, North-South, so-called Strand 2, where these guys are working together, supposed to, because right now they're not. But that is where you could also find the place and the mindset to resolve the problem of the backs off or to help address it. But I think more broadly in the present, we need to ask ourselves, you know, what are we risking in this moment where the Brexit politics have become so harsh, so much, you know, my resolve is bigger than yours. That's what bra bra macho politics is all about. And what we're risking is something that I feel as a French citizen is not always really understood in this country. Um, and it's the question you study it in your classes of linkages. The French sometimes fool themselves that we can have a kind of really problematic, um, difficult, no deal on economics, and yet keep all the nice security stuff where we need Britain. That we can have problems with the deal, but the bilateral stuff that is so important for France and Britain will remain untouched. And they are right that Theresa May took off the possible threat you know, um, uh, in, in one of our first speeches, 
to de-link security. No, we're not going to threaten to take away our... Security is too important. We'll continue to do that together, to fight against terrorism together. That's true. There is no British threat on that, whatever happens on economics. But you know as well as I do that politics is different. These things are connected politically. And so France should not fool itself that it can tell London, give me your bankers for, to create the city of Paris, but give me your Chinooks too for Mali. You, you can't necessarily have it both ways. And we need to really think very hard about these linkages. My 10 minutes are up, so I will very quickly turn to the last point which is the future, the Brexit dilemma of the future. Um, because in a way, that's also what our conversations should be about. Brexit is not a Brexit problem to be solved by the Brits. It is about Europe and the future of Europe. It is about whether we can create a Europe that has learned the lessons from Brexit and where maybe one day the ch our children in Britain will want to rejoin. Well, that is if we haven't reversed Brexit on before then. And what would this EU look like, this realistic utopia? I would like to suggest to you that we really need to pool not just our resources and our sovereignty, but our imaginations. And that's what it's all about in your generation. And what our gen our, your generation cares about is, of course, the future is the question of, of course, climate change and stability of our planet, our very survival. And I would like to suggest to you that perhaps the EU can learn that the short-termist emergency politics that we have witnessed in the last decade, which in part is responsible for the Brexit mindset, ought to be changed because our democracy are subject to presentism, to short-termism, to emergency politics. And that maybe that's what happens with a democracy, you know, because voters' polls are always there. We say that the EU has a democratic deficit. It will be very hard to deal with that democratic deficit, but maybe the EU can actually find a silver lining in this democratic deficit and become a democracy with foresight. Take advantage of the fact that it's not that accountable for every minute of its actions, and indeed build a culture in Europe for doing things now, urgently doing things in the short term, that deal with what will happen 10 years from now, 30 years from now, 60 years from now. Because that is at, what is at stake for your generation, and I really bloody well hope that our generation can help achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a privilege, a pleasure, and honor to be on this panel, although Half of me is thinking, oh, God, not Brexit again. Can't we talk about something else? I mean, in a sense, we can't. Um, it's too important. The stakes are too high. And I want, I want to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, we have to talk about this, and we have to talk about it now. And we have to talk about it in a way that allows us to talk about some other things, too, some things which aren't Brexit but are a bit like Brexit that we have going on in other places uh, as well. And there's a lot of that in the academic literature already. Um, but it's difficult for me uh, on, in this context to talk about Brexit. There's an almost natural sense of guilt, I think, uh, by association that comes with appearing on a panel like this on Brexit as a British citizen uh, and the British citizen who speaks with an English accent. Um, so I should perhaps start by saying that although I am indeed a British citizen, I'm also a Scot, um, which sometimes <laughs> helps, um, and I'm also, for now, at least an EU citizen, and I guess I had always hoped that I would never really have to make a, a, any kind of a choice between those three things. In a sense, I have my own Brexistential dilemmas, or if you like, I am Brexistentially challenged. Um, <laughs> Um, and indeed, I'm so Brexistentially challenged that I'm seeking French naturalization. So, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not automatic. It doesn't necessarily come just because one seeks it, even in the context of Brexit. Um, 
I say this not so much that you forgive me for the guilt by association, uh, but more that you understand where I come from, because I think my first point is that there is no neutral or dispassionate way in talking about these issues. We all have a stake in these issues, every one of us on this panel, and in a sense every one of you in this room has a stake in Brexit in some sense, and has a stake in some of the things that Brexit is also like. Um, so some of my political science colleagues encourage us to think of Brexit as some kind of a natural experiment. Um, I think I'll leave that for them. I think it's, it has too much personal and emotional attached to it for me to treat it as something of that kind. I want to start then, emotionally possibly, with an apology um, not that I'm in much of a position to offer it, really, uh, but it's prompted in large part by John's presence on this panel and some of the things he said, too. But the apology is, in a sense, to the citizens of the Republic of Ireland, himself included, for the extent to which their interests and wishes have essentially been discounted uh, in the debate and the vote for Brexit, and indeed, uh, possibly even worse, in the politics, at least on the British side, uh, of the making of the Brexit uh, that Brexit will ultimately become. Um, that perhaps is the facet of Brexit, there are many, but it's the facet of Brexit that pains me most of all. Um, indeed, the acknowledgement that economies, that polities, that peoples are interdependent such that narrowly domestic choices should be expected to have collateral consequences is the best argument that can possibly be made for European and indeed global governance. It's interdependence that leads us to think that we can't make choices which are consequential for others simply amongst ourselves. And in that sense, referendums, domestic referendums, are potentially dangerous means uh, of resolving domestic issues which have international implications. My, apologies, my apology is perhaps a characteristically British one in that it's offered after the deed is done by someone either unable in my case or unwilling to do anything about it, uh, but in my case at least it's heartfelt. Um, so a few things then about Brexit, which is what I'm supposed to talk about. Um, and I'll try and be controversial uh, in just a little bit. Um, the first is perhaps the most controversial and in some sense the most difficult. Uh, but it's maybe the most important too. Um, I think too much of our collective thinking about the vote for Brexit and the reasons for it is too simple and too convenient. I think it is too easy to dismiss the vote for Brexit as irrational idiocy on the part of Brexiteers. I don't think that will do. To understand Brexit and to understand some of the things like Brexit, I think we have to we have to sort of understand its own rationale. We have to render it intelligible in its own terms. We need to rationalize it, but not by fitting it to some preconceived notion of rationality, but by grasping its own rationale. That rationale may be very different from the rationale that you or I might exhibit if we were asked to think about Brexit or Frexit or whatever in the abstract, but it is a rationale nonetheless, and a rationale, I think, that quite consciously discounted, for many, the economic consequences uh, of the choice that was being made in favor of some other things, maybe things we don't want to think about, but some other things nonetheless. So whilst we might agree that Brexit is economically irrational, that does not necessarily make it irrational per se. I think that's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing for me to say, in a sense, uh, but I think it's the start of an understanding of it. The second point is about turnout and turnout differentials, I think played a crucial role in the vote for Brexit. Um, and those, those turnout differentials were not anticipated by the pollsters. The effect was that analysts, commentators, political scientists, and indeed voters discounted the probability that Brexit could happen too readily, and arguably, if perhaps ironically, this increased the probability of Brexit. Unenthusiastic Remain supporters stayed at home, thinking that Remain could not lose, 
whilst mildly Brexit-inclined protest voters, thinking that it could not win, voted for Brexit to punish the political class in what they perceived to be a more costless gesture than it has turned out to be. The point, my third point, is that Brexit was always more likely than we tended to assume it to be because of these predictable, I would argue, turnout differentials. But there's one turnout differential that has not been widely discussed and I think is crucial for understanding uh, the politics of today, not just in Britain. And it's the distinction between what political scientists sometimes call positional questions and what they sometimes call valence questions. From the perspective of the Remain campaign, the question of continued membership of the EU was a valence issue, a technical and largely economic matter that could be determined for all through the appropriate use of expertise. And the expertise told us that Brexit was stupid. Um, in stark contrast, for both the official and unofficial Leave campaigns, so for Nigel Farage, Barrett, Boris Johnson uh, and the like, Brexit was a positional issue, a question of politics, not of economics, a question of values, of personal conviction and identity, which simply couldn't be reduced to a set of technical or economic considerations that might be adjudicated dispassionately. My point is, though, that when it comes to turnout, positional politics motivates and stimulates participation, whilst valence politics suppresses participation. In other words, positional politics, and I use the verb advisedly, trumps valence politics every time. Um, and that, it strikes me, with or without the verb to trump, uh, is a lesson which goes beyond Brexit, possibly. And we need to think, I think, quite hard about that. It may well be that a majority of British citizens did not support Brexit, but Brexit triumphed because of the way in which the politics was presented and the electoral consequences of the presentation of that. Two concluding points which are a bit more prospective, the future, as it were. There is, for me, something strangely paradoxical, contradictory, and ironic in the end, possibly even tragic, about the character of the vote for Brexit. For on the one hand, it represented, at least in part, a rejection of the precarity produced by neoliberal globalism, uh, a rejection of neoliberal globalism, if you like, for the precarity with which it was associated. And it also represented a rejection of the dull logics of economic necessity with which that neoliberal globalism has typically been associated, in which citizens felt they'd been made to dance to the tune of competitiveness, austerity, labor market flexibility, welfare retrenchment, and so forth, because it was somehow good for them, though no one could explain to them how it was good for them. It was kind of good for the economy, and because it was good for the economy, it was just good. It was, in a sense, a taking back of control of politics uh, from these logics of economic compulsion. But this is where the tragedy kicks in, because the consequence is to ratchet up precisely every single one of those effects. So those displaced by globalization voted for Brexit in order to bring it, in, bring it to an end, only to find the logic of economic compulsion that it produces reinforced and ratcheted, and ratcheted up. That I find tragic, and I suspect it will not end well. And that brings me to a final point. Though we tend not to think of it this way, Brexit is a process of translation. Indeed, Fiona made a similar point, I think. The turning, in effect, of a multitude of imagined possible Brexits into one substantive, actually existing Brexit, as it will become at some point in some distant future. That, of course, will be a Brexit that no one voted for, and of course, those, most of those touched by it didn't even get a chance to vote anyway. It will also be a Brexit that no one really envisaged because it isn't really something one can envisage now even. Um, put like that, I think it can only fail to disappoint and it can only fail to disappoint probably most of those who voted for it. At that point, a new politics will kick in it's 
almost impossible to imagine the content of that politics. But we shouldn't think, for instance, that if Britain leaves even with no deal on the 29th of March, that is essentially the end of it. It's just the beginning of something different. Thank you very much. Maybe before giving, uh, uh, letting you asking some questions from the floor, if you want to react, all, all of you, a couple of minutes to some uh, provocative uh, words that have yeah. been said. I, I was very struck with Colin's analysis. Um, I agree with it. Um, I think there were rational reasons um, for people to vote for Brexit. I think the process now is irrational. I think the point about how... Um, the Leave campaign won is, is really important. If you haven't watched the film produced by Channel 4, I think it was called The Uncivil War with uh, ben Benedict Cumberbatch, um, I recommend you do. It was painful to watch, but it was very true. Um, they did break the law. Um, they did harvest information from personality tests on Facebook and others to push adverts to pol political groups. And I think in terms of the politics, um, it might not be the same in Europe, and I think it'd be interesting to see what everybody else says in continental Europe. But there was a lot of um, people voting against being left behind. And the two-party system and the politics of a two-party system in the United Kingdom meant for decades, both the Conservatives and Labour only had to fight marginal seats. They didn't have to fight everywhere. So there were whole parts, and particularly the northeast of England or other parts that uh, had been left behind ec economically. And I think there's a real lesson there for politicians, and perhaps uh, it's not for me, I'm, we're not uh, contesting European elections uh, because of what's happening, but there is a lesson in politicians making sure that they reach out to, to, to everybody. And I think that's probably, if I was to say from our experience, what we can contribute <coughs> elsewhere. And I think the idea of um, elitist intellectuals uh, thinking they know everything and undervaluing um, the rights of citizens to express themselves and their anger at an economic system should not be underestimated, I suppose, is my advice. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I, I, I think the Collins distinction between the two types of voting I've forgotten the second one. <laughs> one was positional, and the other was something else. Like, but it doesn't uh, matter. But <laughs> I, I think it, there is a real lesson to be learned here as far as the future of the European Union is concerned. I don't think we can rely on economic cal calculation on its own to keep the European Union together and the many difficult challenges the European Union is facing. I believe very strongly <coughs> that we have got to invest in European patriotism, uh, in the flag, in the anthem, in building a sense of common achievement, in building a sense that this is something quite unique that we have done voluntarily uh, as, as Europeans over the last um, 70 years. I had the experience of speaking in the United States for five years representing the European Union, and I was able to point out to them that Every other union in the world was created as a result of the use of force. The United States was created by force and was kept together by force. The United Kingdom was created by force. Um, and France was created by force indeed, uh, if you go back far enough. The European Union is unique in that it is something that was created voluntarily by free agreement. And in a sense, Brexit is proving, is proving what a, a marvellous thing the European Union is, in the sense that a country can actually leave. Now, it's not going to be easy, of course. Tearing up 44 years of work is never going to be easy. But Britain will leave. This is not a pr the European Union is not a prison of the nations, or a prison for nations. The European Union is a free union. But if it's to work as a free union, we've got to invest far more in it. And we must not blame the European Union for problems that are the responsibility of other forces, either domestic problems, which is all too frequent, countries saying, oh, this was imposed upon us by Brussels, or blaming European, un blaming European Union for, for example, globalization. Globalization has created huge benefits and huge problems. But globalization is not an invention of the European Union. The European Union is trying to cope with globalization. 
Um, last point, I mean, there is, in my view, nothing <coughs> macho about the position of the European Union in its negotiation with Britain. What we want, if there's to be a compromise, and I hope there will be, is that first we must see evidence that our interlocutors in Britain are prepared to take ownership, true ownership, that a majority in the House of Commons is of a mind to take ownership of a compromise, make sacrifices, accept trade-offs to get a compromise through. I don't feel that that point has yet been reached. I don't feel that Britain is ready, that there's a majority in the House of Commons ready to take ownership of compromise. I believe that if there was evidence, and this is going to be an emotional communication from Britain, not some detailed thing, if Britain emotionally comes across as saying, here we are willing to make a compromise, then I haven't the slightest doubt that the European Union will be forthcoming. I haven't the slightest doubt that Ireland will be forthcoming too, because we want there to be a deal more than anybody. But Britain must make the first move. Britain must show willing, and so far they haven't done it. <clears throat> One, I completely agree with John, and we can't insist enough that the silver lining of Brexit is that it demonstrates that the EU is a community by choice. It's not the United States 1865. If you want to leave, you can leave. There won't be a war. That is a beautiful thing. It's the only beautiful thing about Brexit. Um, but if that's true, then we need to be consistent and make sure that ourselves, our citizens, and the world understand that the EU is benign about a country leaving. That it's not about punishing. And indeed, we always say it's not about punishing. It's not, it's about, not about punishing. But oh. let's make sure that the way we do Brexit is not perceived that way. Um, the second point is Fiona Kumberbach. Indeed, I back her uh, encouragement. See this film, you know, the Sherlock Holmes uh, actor really is the best to convey what happened in that moment where somehow he's reading a book in bed because his wife is pregnant and then and he's reading about pregnancy, and for some reason reading about, I don't know why, but reading about pregnancy leads him to come up with the slogan, take back control. And the film makes a lot out of this, but all of us made a lot out of this. I can tell you, I was at the time uh, in part between Sciences Po and Oxford with my students trying to create a website where we said, you know, Britain, please stay in fun, humoristic <laughs> ways. And when we heard the take back control, all of us and me first were so depressed. This was the best slogan ever, ever, especially for someone who was in the 2005 campaign on the French constitutional debate, taking back control. If you have adolescent kids, you really understand, you know, what it means. You know, she slaps your, her, the door at your face when you're trying to go in her room because she's taking back control. It's not that far away for you guys. <laughs> it's the most basic human instinct. And what we do know is that indeed, as Colin was saying, you know, modernity is, I mean, Brexit is very banal. It's an example of a choice that we all make as individuals, as groups and as countries, as to the balance between cooperation and its benefit and control and its benefit. There's always a trade-off and we're somewhere on that trade-off and countries will make different types of choices about that trade-off. Um, so in that sense, Brexit is very banal, but appealing to people's sense and intuition that they want control over their lives is, is, is fundamental. Now, of course, we, and you learn it with Professor Letta and all your professors in European studies, we repeat it, and you say that, of course, the EU, in a way, gives us also control, because it gives us control in each other and our externalities, and it gives us more control over what happens in the world out there, together. Okay, we make this reasoning. We say it magnifies our individual power. But that's a, very, a message that's a bit complicated, I found, when we were campaigning for Remain. So we need to hone in our discourse about this question of cooperation and control. And finally, I can't help but react to John's point about EU and globalization in Sciences Po, where we have Piketty and other colleagues, where many of us have questioned, indeed, the fact that 
yes, Europe is a, in part about helping us manage globalization, uh, but it's also a project that has sometimes magnified the problems created by, by the at least some neoliberal versions of globalization. And the, here I speak perhaps with my hat, my Greek hat. Uh, Lucas Tukalis is in the room. He might or might not echo me. But um, the point about this is that it's not clear that there was and is one and only way for us collectively as European countries to deal at least with one aspect of globalization, which is financial globalization. And, and academic studies have shown that actually, yes, the left behinds are behind the yearning for control. And yes, they may be misguided in ways that Colin was describing. But actually, if you look at how the left behinds impact votes of the kind of, that we know with Brexit, but also in Italy and elsewhere, the intervening variable, what makes a difference, is the kind of welfare state that you have, the kind of safety net and social policy and rights of trade unions, etc., that play a role as intervening variable to cushion and manage the, the shock of globalization in the life of people who are the most mm. disadvantaged. So it's not an easy equation, and we always need to remind ourselves of that. Thank you. Uh, Colin, if you want to... Well, maybe just just a tiniest of tiny points. I mean, the first, the first of the tiny points, but it's a very significant one, I think, in a sense, is that we would, of course, be across the line were it not for one thing. The one thing is the giving to Parliament of the choice. So you have a referendum which mandates the British government to seek a deal, it seeks a deal and it negotiates, negotiates that deal bilaterally, multilaterally, bilaterally because it was negotiated with the EU27 who were united. So it's a bilateral negotiation. It reaches a conclusion. That is the deal. So you think that's, that's the logical end of the process. But no, no, no. Because in the intervening period of time, taking back control you have interpreted to mean that Parliament has to then pass a judgment on the deal that you have. And the problem is that the deal that you've just negotiated can't work through Parliament. Indeed, there is no deal that appears to work through Parliament. Mm. So it is the complicated relationship between parliamentary sovereignty, a diplomatic process, and the sovereignty of the people expressed in a referendum which produces this mess. So where does the Brexistential dilemma come from in the first place? It comes from three different principles or ways of reaching a decision which all have to produce uh, a deal that everyone can sign up to um, and that doesn't work so there is another lesson which comes from brexit which is don't do it this way if you're thinking about well, i'm not saying anyone's terribly seriously thinking about frexit but please if you think about frexit don't do it the way britain tried to do it <laughs> thank you Okay, good. I think we have a couple of minutes to uh, to answer to questions or to uh, listen to you. Oh yes, we have to, we have on, until seven p.m. sharp. Uh, so please do not hesitate. Uh, introduce yourself and uh, ask question. And uh, please uh, tell who you direct the question to. So there's a question there. Yeah, I've got some mic on both sides, yes, indeed. Or maybe the mic should, no, I don't know. Xavier, um, merci de venir. Hello. Um, yeah, okay. so Julian from the UK, um, doing Master in European yeah. Affairs. Um, I just had a quick question for Colin Hay, because uh, I got the impression that David Cameron sort of calculated that um, going really hard on the economic message actually had worked well, really well for him um, up until uh, Brexit. So in 2010, he kind of made the point that um, Labour had been a disaster for the economy. And then in 2015, again, he, you know, he very famously said that um, there would be chaos, economic chaos under Ed Miliband. So I'm just wondering, given what you said about positional versus valent politics, why, why, did that why, why did that no longer work when it came to Brexit? Especially as, as we, we get the impression, like we often talk about the, the British people as being very economy orientated and, yeah. Yeah, can I 
Can I answer sure, directly? Sure. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. I think what one sees around that period of time is essentially the the origins of this populist moment, which punctured a certain style of politics, which I mean, Britain was, which Britain had expressed for a 20 or 30 year period. In that 30, 20 or 30 year period, both of the mainstream, or the then mainstream parties, Labour and the Conservatives, sought to outcompete each other in a sense on their economic competence. The competition was over that. Um, and in that sense, Cameron was, in 2010, merely playing politics by the then established rules of the day. It's the politicization of the question of Europe, above all by UKIP, that begins to change the tenor of the debate in such a way, I think, that these puncturing positional questions come to tear apart a sort of consensus. Um, and so it's kind of interesting that both the Conservatives and Labour in the last few days are now split to the point of having MPs uh, losing the whip or rejecting the whip. Uh, that's, that's, I mean, it's not unprecedented, but it's, it's not something that happens uh, significantly. And it's very unusual to have a government which ostensibly on Brexit, uh, for the first time in a very long period of time, has completely ignored the economic advice of its Treasury and the Bank of England uh, in doing something that would be regarded to be, by them, clearly economically suicidal. Um, so what we think, I mean, I think you describe it very well. What we have is politics being played by the normal rules is trumped, if you like, by, uh, by a populist politics. Now, that won't always happen, but it has a, there is a propensity for it to happen, and there is a greater propensity for it to happen today than there was in 2010. I think that's my point. Mm. No, there's some question that you have to move. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another Brett. My name's Cameron. Um, do you not think that, um, considering the way the press, in particular, and politicians talk about talked about the EU in the UK, that Brexit was a question of when rather than if? That's an open question. Um, yes, uh, and I think that everybody has responsibility. It was, and I don't think it was exclusive to um, Britain. I think ac across Europe, it's easy for national governments to say we'll take the credit for all the good things and all the bad things we'll blame on the EU. And I think you can have a complicit media. Um, I think there is a real issue in terms of how the media in the UK treated UKIP, who had no members of parliament at Westminster, but also got acres and acres of coverage and space. Uh, space, um, so I, I think that you know people have to take responsibility for for, for their actions, and I think that's a danger, and that's a lesson learned. Um, so um, the other thing I would say is looking at Scotland. Uh, one of the things to be aware of, when we had our independence referendum in 2014 both the yes side and the no side, one of the strongest arguments was how important European Union membership was. So we'd had years of debate um, on a constitutional question or referendum, which actually was saying European Union membership is a good thing. Now, you know, would I like to think that Scotland is more European historically, etc.? Yes, I think it is. But I think that probably helped in that period because the benefits of European Union membership um, were being argued in Scotland for the you know the years leading up in you know 2012, 2013, 2014 that wasn't the case in the rest of the UK. Can I add a footnote? Sure, sure, sure. Um, never forget that only 37% of the British electorate voted for Brexit. Mm. And of course, it's the rules of democracy. But I, I'm a bit disturbed sometimes when on the continent I hear, oh, the British hate Europe. You know, there's only these 37%. And especially in your generation, there's a lot of passion for Europe. Let, let's, let's stop always saying, oh, the Brits, they're transactional and they only talk economics and even the Remainers made calculation. No, I mean, I've met hundreds and hundreds of British people who actually have a passion for being European. Um, and in fact, there is agency in the world to say that it was only a question of when and not, not if. No, I mean, you know, uh, partly, 
there was some, a lot of, and Colin said that this enfranchisement, a lot of young people, for instance, couldn't vote. Uh, there was the issue of the age for voting, but also was made difficult. Um, Glastonbury Festival, some of you may have gone there, uh, you know, wanted to have voting booths, 300,000 young people, most of whom who had voted remain, uh, you know, couldn't vote because they were not allowed to have, uh, to vote outside their city, etc., etc. So, you know, sometimes it's a very small thing. It wasn't unavoidable, far from it. I, I think another factor that makes a difference is the way in which party leaders are chosen in Britain. Traditionally, it used to be by members of the parliamentary parties. Now, once mass membership has become the determinant of who the leader is, particularly in the case of the Conservative Party, because their membership is small and old, it has driven, it has pushed the Conservative Party towards a more anti-Brexit position than what than might be the normal preferred position of the majority of Conservative voters, as you think from members. <coughs> Okay, question, yes, maybe. Thank you. My name is Sean. I'm from the U.S. My question is for Mr. John Burton. Bruton. Regarding a border poll, I agree that a narrow majority for a united Ireland would risk the peace achieved by the Good Friday Agreement. But given this reasoning, when is an appropriate time or context for a border poll to achieve a united Ireland in which radical unionists wouldn't react with violence? It's impossible to answer that question in terms of time. It, it all depends on the evolution of sentiment among the unionist population. Um, unfortunately, the situation in Northern Ireland at the moment is that the so-called loyalist community is living in a, in a relatively isolated condition. They don't uh, meet members of the, of the nationalist community uh, in sport. Uh, they don't meet them at church. They don't go to the same schools. The only place that they have anything in common with one another is in the workplace. So there isn't a, a sort of supportive environment for building the sort of trust between the two communities uh, that would make any arrangement, whether it be a united Ireland or the continuance in the UK, something that everybody would accept. Uh, because there isn't a sort of sense of internal uh, cohesion across uh, the traditional divide. And I think we will need generation or a generation or more of work on building a sort of a, a sense of common identity across the traditional religious divide in Northern Ireland and, and only then I think would any uh, any solution either per staying permanently in the UK or joining United Ireland only then would any of those possible solutions be one which would really win the sort of full-hearted acceptance that is required for peace to be preserved. Hi. Yes, please. Thank you, everyone, for their speeches. My name is Handa. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm Dutch-Turkish. Um, I have a question for Professor Nikolaidis. Um, I really like your idea of, you know, the need to reinvent a language for democracy that is recognized or that recognizes different uh, cultures and languages. Um, I, w I was just wondering whether you could elaborate a bit more on that because the idea that I have or the, the observation that I have is that the UK, a multinational country, is at this point like a perfect example of how um, creating an, an idealized language for democracy is actually failing at the point. Um, how, if, like, if, if this is happening in, in the UK, a multinational country, Brexit is happening, we see the different regions reacting uh, uh, in a different way, how, if, if this is happening in the UK, how can we imagine something like this for Europe, ideally? I mean, in a way, I'd like to throw the question back to all of you. Uh, can I ask you, actually, sorry, what's your name? Hande. Hande. To answer Handa's question with one word that you throw at me, <laughs> I mean, tell me, give me words that would be that language that you guys are going to reinvent in your lifetime for our democracy. Anybody? Come on. <laughs> Sorry, you're saying things to your neighbors, but can you say it louder? <laughs> huh? Esperanto? English? Sorry? Tolerance. Tolerance? So listening is a language in a way, yeah? And tolerating, and what do you do when you tolerate? You empathize with the other side, empathy. 
So maybe that language is a mindset. Anybody else? Multicultural, but it's an ism. Mm, ah, it's a bit, but multicultural. So taking in all other people's language, um, cultures and learning their language, their language. Ah, okay, maybe the EU or Europe is a promise because it's a community of translation at its best, at its best, as a community across border and within each of its countries where Turkish citizens and, and citizens from around the world make the EU kind of a microcosmos, where indeed we try to do it, multiculturalism, but then maybe we fail. Maybe there's more and more incidents that show that we fail. Why do we fail? Maybe we need, what other, other suggestions? Maybe from the panel. Sorry? <laughs> maybe from, from the, the panel. panel. <laughs> so maybe I will throw in some words, stories. <coughs> maybe we need to tell more stories about where we come from, how we feel. I, I'm, I'm going to publish a book on Brexit where those stories I extract from Greek mythology, the Bible, Muslim stories, stories that are shared from our collective unconscious. The book is crowdfunded, by the way, if anybody is interested. <laughs> uh, so, but I would like to, uh, so I have my answer then in that book. That's what we do, you know, we write books as, as academics. But I would pre prefer to leave it as a question that you kind of all think about and discuss, but I'm sure the panel might have other answers. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really impo important point because um, we haven't talked about one of the big issues in the uh, Brexit voting campaign was uh, people's attitudes towards immigration. And that really, at the end of the day, was probably one of the core aspects. And there was a horrible, I think, really negative, toxic approach to immigration um, that was developing within the United Kingdom that wasn't challenged by the leadership of any of the parties. Indeed, the Labour Party um, had a, a dreadful mug about, you know, they actually talked about um, control of my uh, immigration, but in a quite aggressive way. Um, you had the Theresa May sending vans around London that, that said, migrants go home. You know, this was really negative and really toxic. Now, I'm not saying that Scotland somehow is, you know, um, somehow, you know, exempt from concerns about issues, but we've also deliberately, and you have to, as political leadership, deliberately try and create an environment where people feel, feel at home, and it's telling stories. People are interested in people. And so therefore, when we celebrate St Andrews, we do that with our Syrian communities, we do it with our Polish communities, we do it with our Irish communities, our Italian communities. They tell their stories and they share them with how they see Scotland's stories. And actually that's a huge amount of that trust because people like people. And I know that's very simplistic, but we're also deliberately in Scotland and the Scottish government is deliberately making sure we're sending out our messaging that we are all Scotland and telling the stories. And if you go on our Scotland Is Now website and, and our, our Twitter account, you'll see stories about celebrating the other. And celebrating the other and being able to hold more than one identity in your head is part of our Scottish Gaelic tradition. But in Scotland, we have people who are quite ha comfortable and happy to talk about themselves as Scots Asians in a way that that doesn't happen in the rest of the UK. So the, one of the, the, thing, the beautiful things about, um, I think, the European Union is that diversity is strength. Diversity and the complexity of the culture that has shaped Europe but is still shaping Europe and is in this room. And the culture side of this, as a culture secretary in Scotland, I think I'm absolutely passionate about. And I think the power of the idea, you can never suppress the power of an idea. And I think the idea of exchange and translation and people's stories should be at the essence. I, can, I get concerned when people talk about the European Union is about we're reforming institutions and we're reforming this. It's an apology. Reform is an apology. It actually has to be about celebrating. I think John talked about that a bit himself as well. And perhaps we need to get back into the spirit of that and telling each other's stories and celebrating it is the best way to make sure we have peace, but also that understanding across Europe. I, I just say, um, avoid blaming other people and take responsibility yourself. I think it would, is what's needed. Uh, the idea that young people who went to Glastonbury and didn't vote would blame the politicians for the outcome is not very intelligent. 
people have to take responsibility themselves for what happens in politics. Uh, the politicians that you get are the politicians that you vote for, and you must take you must take personal responsibility for the future of your country. If I could like quickly share like a, an anecdote um, very quickly, because I really want to emphasize, emphasize your um, uh, point uh, about like accepting diversity and how diverse is a strength. I have like a lot of friends from Scotland, from Ireland too, especially from these two uh, well, Ireland countries, Scotland region. Um, but they're mostly people of migrant backgrounds. So I got to know Scotland, I got to know Ireland uh, uh, through the eyes of, of young Muslims from with a minority background. Because I work at the at, at a European level with like an, uh, a youth Muslim NGO. Mm. But um, this shows like how young people, how people with like a lot of different backgrounds actually work so hard together for like a cohesive Europe um, by accepting their own backgrounds together with the, with the country and the, 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 long, the, the culture that they live in. And this is like the, the strength I, I see in Europe, uh, in, in this room actually, with all of these, like I don't know how many hundred people we are here, but I think this is the only way we can go forward. Yeah. So we have time for a couple of questions. We have Hi there, I'm Sam. I'm on the Master of Public Affairs um, program. I uh, speak with a southern British accent, but it's probably evident from the colour of my hair. I've got roots in all four corners of the, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and I think that, that, that point on stories is really, is really um, important. As a very proud unionist, I think the British people need to actually do more of that, speaking to all four parts, corners of the United Kingdom. My question is probably towards the, um, the Brits on the stage is, I, I think it'd be interesting just to hear a clarification about what on the surface may seem like a logical um, fallacy, which is that Scotland is unhappy with laws being set in London over them, but they are happy to, they would be happy as an independent nation to go to Brussels to have laws set over, over them from there. <laughs> Well, we have not voted for any of the governments, uh, the Conservative governments, uh, in terms of you know, every time you know, we vote, we're not getting the government that we vote for. Um, so that's a challenge internally within the United Kingdom and the, and the differences there in terms of how we vote and, and compared to uh, the rest of the UK. But it's a point about whether you're uh, in a union of equals or when you're whether in a union of unequals. And I think John made the point himself. I, I'm not sure if it was John Eclipse who said that the problem with the union of the United Kingdom is it's not a union of equals. It's We were told that we should be treated with respect, etc., but that hasn't happened. The difference with the European Union is that it, and this is a challenge, people might dispute this because of the bigger states, the role of France or Germany, etc., is meant to be a, 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 a union of equals. And I just want to quote uh, Leo Varadka on Tishuk, uh, who said uh, in Ireland, as a leader of a small country that is fully committed to the European Union, this solidarity resonates deeply in Ireland, but not just in Ireland, in all as small member states as well. And that's to, to do with the recent, obviously, Brexit situation. Because if you're in a, a union where you're a union of equals and you're interdependent, that's different from being a union within the United Kingdom, which is not a, a union of equals. And, I, and even if we all voted one way in Scotland, uh, we'll get a result that's different in the rest of the UK. And that really is a, a crisis and a democratic deficit. And it's why it's preferable for Scotland to be in a union of equals as an independent country and pooling and sharing our sovereignty than in the current situation that, that we're in. And we have a majority of uh, MPs um, from Scotland are SNP MPs, my party, and our government has been in power for 12 years. And uh, with a consistent of 40% of the vote. We are, have tried to explain to the rest of Europe that you know, we are a nationalist party, yes, but we're a civic nationalist party and that we're pro-European. Um, and in terms of um, you know, the current debate, we are popular as opposed to being populist. Uh, but I hope that gives you some understanding of why we think pooling and sharing sovereignty in a union of equals is better than one that is unequal. Could I maybe come on on this too? I, I mean, I think it's a it's a very well posed question, and it's in a way it goes beyond I think just the UK and Great Britain. I think it's a wider question because it strikes me that we live in an age in which previously relatively homogeneous polities have become more fractious and fractured, and one of the consequences of that is that it tends to be. It tends to drive a kind of politics which is about forming smaller sovereign entities 
which wish to govern themselves autonomously. The problem with that tendency is it leaves all the collateral damage, which I started with, about the consequences of those choices for those who aren't included within the choice. Uh, and I think that means that we have to think about multi-level democracy, democracy not just at that lowest level but at other levels too, in a slightly different way. I mean, the answer to the previous question from the panel was very much a kind of positive notion of democracy. What's the best best possible imagined democracy that we can come up with which, which, which works at that kind of level? I think we can also think a little bit about a kind of more negative notion of democracy, which is how to protect democratic populations, particularly maybe in small nations, uh, from the democratically made choices of others which cause collateral damage or have the potential to cause collateral damage for them. And I think that's how we have to think about questions like environmental governance too, actually. So it's not about what, how can we imagine a positive global governance. I mean, that would be fantastic, uh, but I've still yet to read anyone terribly compelling or convincing on that. But a more negative conception of democracy, which is how can we ensure that there is a mechanism which prevents this, these collateral damages being caused, is I think a better way of thinking about it, actually. Mm. Um, and if I can just support Colin, but put it in slightly different terms, you know, uh, it is true that the EU at its best is a community of equals. Um, in the Treaty of Rome, the whole institutions really empower smaller countries uh, in many different ways. Uh, in fact, you could even generalize that, you know, unions such as the EU is about really mitigating real power differentials. Nevertheless, you know, what the EU really deserves for me, because I love the EU, is tough love. That is, we need to be critical of the EU when it deserves us to be critical. And in that kind of mindset of tough love, we also need to face the fact that in the last decade, the EU has moved from mitigating power differential, being a union of equal, to often magnifying power differentials. Because we are in a politics of emergency, in a politics of debt and creditor and debitors, etc. And indeed, I, I would say that the greatest challenge, one of the greatest challenges facing the EU is to recover that spirit of a community of equal. And it's true that Ireland these days is backed by the rest of the EU. I'm not saying it never happens. Uh, smaller countries can be supported by the rest. But when they're real tough bargaining negotiations, it's good old power that matters in the EU too. Let's not fool ourselves. And therefore, I think what we need to look for in Colin's kind of perspective, but I think it's shared by the panel, it's really a culture where we learn as people at school, through the media, etc., to be other regarding, that our domestic politics and our domestic democracies are such that we're always trying to understand and fit in the viewpoint of others, that we're opening the black box of other countries, that when Germans look at Greece, they look at the most vulnerable, who is suffering, etc. That yeah. that's how we look at each other. Yeah. And there is a long road of relearning to do there. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ige. I'm Somali-Canadian. Uh, in Canada, we had two referendums where the what we would call the Remain side barely won, and uh, they were a uh, question of unity and uh, very, very tumultuous. So my question is around the role of governance and the role of politicians. So what has Brexit taught you in terms of, uh, on questions of unity and independence, and also on the role of uh, politicians who are meant to negotiate these issues, uh, and to the secretary, and to a lesser degree to uh, uh, the former prime minister, is the road to independence and or unity only through a referendum? Well, I, I would say uh, a referendum is more often the road to disunity <laughs> because it reduces what is often a very complex question to a binary choice. 
and people are forced to take sides on one side or the other of that binary choice. So I am not in favour of referendums uh, as a means of uh, deciding what's best. I believe in parliamentary democracy, representative parliamentary democracy, where you uh, put your trust in your local <coughs> politician and if you don't like what he or she has done in two or five years' time, you vote them out and put someone else in. As to the lesson of Brexit in particular for politicians, I would say the big lesson of the Brexit disaster is if you make an agreement, you should sell it. You should not abandon it the day after and decide you're going to go off on a different tack. David Cameron made an agreement. He got substantial concessions in the agreement that he made with the European Union, some of which were extremely bad concessions, in my view. Concessions he should not have been given, like the red card on, on, on legislation. Others which were substantial on immigration. But no sooner had he made this agreement and announced the referendum, he decided he wasn't going to campaign on it at all because it was too complex, too complicated to explain. But I think we've got to, you know, you've got to, if you, we, the world is complex. Politicians have to explain complexity. And if they are to explain complexity, they should not expect people to understand it the first time, or the second time, or the third time. They may grasp it at the fourth occasion. So you have got to be willing to bore yourself to death, repeating and explaining difficult, complex decisions that you have negotiated. Don't give up and go instead for sound bites and simplicities. Also, I think, in the, le the lesson of the referendum that I would learn, is that Britain yes. totally yes. undersold its own contribution to European history. It failed to explain that as a nation, Britain went to war to defend Belgian neutrality in 1914. It went to war to defend Poland and Poland's independence in 1939, and yet was not proud of that enough to say, well, Poles should be welcome in Britain as members of the European Union to come here and work. Having made the supreme sacrifice for Poland in 1939, they weren't prepared to even make a small sacrifice for Poland in, in, in 2016. Now, to my mind, that all be betrayed an unwillingness of political leadership to be courageous, A, in explaining complexity, and B, in, t in explaining people's history to them, and explaining to them that for the last 2,000 years, Britain has been affected by what being what's happening on the, con on the continent of Europe. It has been trying to influence what's been happening on the continent of Europe for the last 2,000 years, and opting out of Europe is very un-British. <laughs> okay, so the final word, sorry, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. I'll, be, I'll try to be quick. Um, so obviously John comes from a country that is used to having lots of referendums. Uh, we come from a country that have only had a few but fairly fundamental ones. Um, on the lessons from the negotiations, I, I absolutely think, as I said previously about um, Mr. Barry having a mandate, having you know, nurtured the U27, working collectively, whereas uh, Theresa May didn't get her mandate properly from the Parliament. I think Colin referred to that as well. Um, I think referendums are important because it's about permission. It's, and I think people's permission is very, very important within that. But I also think um, if you remember why David Cameron had the referendum, it was actually to sort the internal politics of the Conservative Party, and the referendum was meant to sort that. Um, and all it did was transfer it into what then became the negotiations. So that is all about being ho held hostage by one extreme set within your own political party, and that's no reason to have a referendum. So you do need referendums for, for big issues, I understand that. Um, uh, but I also think, and this is fairly fundamental, and David Cameron was far too complacent, and he's left the field, and everybody else is having to pick up the pieces, um, you should hold a referendum when you know you can win, <laughs> which I think is, and you have to know and not assume. And I was the minister in Scotland who planned for potentially a no 
um, and, and a, a position that was to leave because I thought it might happen. I didn't want it to happen, but I thought it would. And nobody else in the United Kingdom had actually planned for situation um, if it was for leave. There was no plan. And I think that is the biggest abdication of responsibility that's having collateral damage all over the place. So my advice is for politicians, I also echo the point, perhaps to use a Scottish word, it's not about courageous, is to be brave. You have to be brave and you have to lead and you should never be complacent. I, I, I have a more, more... One minute after we get... <clears throat> hey, on the EU, you must... You, I would love to hear what you think about languages of translation as a Somalian, Somalian Canadian, but let me say that our, our Europe hopefully has learned that maybe we need to stop presenting the struggle for Europe as one or a simple... Um, tyranny of dichotomies, more or less Europe, us versus them. We need to rethink our commonality. We need to also understand that to, to really deal with the aspiration for independence that you were talking about in an interdependent world, we need states and we need wise states. We need cunning states that know how to distribute risks and costs. And that's what the British states didn't do because there was an economy that benefited indeed from the poles, but some communities were not really dealt with uh, by the state. So we have to rethink the role of the state much better. I think we have all learned about British politics. And yes, we've all said, and you all say, what a mess, what a mess this is. But isn't it a glorious democratic mess? Aren't you all learning about weird British procedures? I mean, isn't it interesting what is going on in Britain? Let's stop just pointing the finger and realize that how else can you do something like Brexit? It's a crazy, mad thing to do. It's no wonder that it's a mess in Britain. And let me finally counter a bit um, some of the um, uh, uh, cynicism about referenda, because we live in the 21st century. We live in the world of the internet, where more and more we'll have virtual politics, we will have direct democracy bottom up in many different ways. And referenda are part of that. So I would say, do not give up on referenda, but do them better. Preferenda, upstream, lots of communication. Let's learn from the Swiss here. Okay, thank you. So, the final word by uh, uh, I, I think having, ha having a Brexit deal is easier than squeezing my 10 conclusion points in two minutes. Uh, but the most important point is that we will have three other events organized by uh, our two centers of research, our two schools. When we decided this event, we were four months ago with Florence and, and Xavier, we, uh, we were quite sure to have uh, a deal now. Uh, and now we are in a completely open um, situation. I had uh, the, the, the idea at the end of this meeting that, first of all, uh, it's, it's a question on how to limit damages. There's not an happy end in this story, that's very clear. And the key point is the fact that no deal remains better, it remains worse than, uh, than a Brexit with a deal. That's very clear, because what um, John told us about the border and the perception of the Irish people, of the potential uh, uh, EU rigidity on the border can be one of the problems of the of the consequences uh, of the situation. I have to say also uh, not to forget the beginning with the mother of all the mistakes with the way in which uh, David Cameron asked uh, the referendum because at the end of the day it's very important to say in all the, this discussion about populism people, vote, elite. That was a failure of the most elite of the elite, because at the end of the day, the way in which the referendum was negotiated with the European Union and then uh, with, with the proposal of this referendum and this question, I have to say that the question was one of the problems, because the question of leaving without the question of the destination I think was and is one of the big problems today. But the key, problem, the key point is also about 
another for what I heard, a big point about the role of the European Union. I think what we uh, heard about Ireland is very important. The European Union as protector of a small or medium-sized country. For Ireland today, being part of the European Union is, is, a, is a big shield in this very complicated uh, uh, discussion they, they are having or we are having. And at the same time, uh, the other key point about the internal and domestic uh, discussion is about um, which kind of deal can be supported in the Commons. I think this is a very domestic and very short-term question, but decisive in this very moment, and that was one of the uh, points. At the same time, I think the, the true meaning of Brexit today is, is more clear. Even in this debate, we had some very important clarifications. And I uh, strongly support the idea that uh, uh, the, 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 the brand Brexit was very strong, and the brand a take back control, as uh, Calypso said, was and was one of the reasons uh, of the uh, importance and of the success. I have to say that maybe we have at the end of this meeting, we have a question and maybe we will try to answer this question in the next weeks. And the big question is, uh, will a chaotic Brexit push at the European elections pro-European parties or anti-European parties? It's, it's, uh, it's not an easy question to answer, because sometime in, uh, in today's politics, in today's world, Bresk, uh, mech, mess uh, brings mess, and that is a, a, a non-rational point. But at the end of the day, I think what, what uh, Colin and uh, Fiona said about identity and diversity is very important. Brexit is an attack to the, to the heart of the European way to think identity. Because the European identity is an identity in which you are uh, from your city, your region, your country, and you are European too. And at the end of the day, the big challenge is exactly about identity. I have to give you a, a very good news, that is uh, Sciences Po is organizing, is trying to organize a great event, and I think it would be very important if you are able to uh, be part of this event. The European elections, uh, uh, May the 26th, in uh, Paris, Paris and in other European countries, in other would be uh, Thursday the 23rd, but May the 26th will be the, the most important moment. So we decided to organize a panel, uh, a network of universities for the discussion of the uh, results. And we are very happy because we had a TV, the television is Arte, uh, which decided to be part of this project. So we will be five universities connected the night of the results. Sciences Po will lead this project with uh, Bocconi University in Milan, with uh, a Stockholm School of Economics in uh, Stockholm, uh, with uh, Charles University in Prague to have uh, a Central and Eastern European uh, point of view, and with Erte School of Governance in uh, uh, Berlin. So uh, we will be five group of professors, students, people discussing, connected uh, online and connected with Arte. I think that will be great. In the next weeks, you will have the, all the uh, registration details to be part of this event. I think it's a great way to uh, be part of this European discussion. Uh, Please join me in uh, having a great hand for uh, our panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>